The Lord be with you. Pat, I want to let you know Doyle leaned over and asked me, can the choir do that song as a special next Sunday? Scotty did that and I said it's the invitation. Good, awesome, awesome. I think it's a great, no, that's, that's wonderful. And I, what I love about this is from my angle it looked one way, from yours it looks another. But I know that uh, at the heart of it is the message that we hear from the song, it's so simple, love, and how easy that can be. You've heard me say that a time or two, I'm sure. So thank you, Nikki, for leading us in that. I ask you would join with me in turning in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 16. Doyle also told me I wasn't going to have long to preach this morning, which I don't know. I mean, we'll see. Luke chapter 16, I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 13 there this morning. (coughs) Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 1. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, make it fifty. Then he asked another, How much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill, make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you who have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth... Who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, we pray that we hear what you would have us to hear. That my words, Lord, whatever I put in the way will be forgotten. And that the words you speak to us, Lord, will be the ones that we remember that stir us to change, to do what you call us to do, that we may be the people you call us to be. In your holy name we pray. Amen. This past Wednesday, Sally and I marked one year with Cole. Uh, A year ago Wednesday, we were in uh, what was at one time an apartment build, apartment now was an office. I remember sitting there signing papers, sweating, because that's just what I do. And signing papers, making copies of stuff. And they told us, it's real anticlimactic. That when it happens, you'll think, oh, there are going to be fireworks and confetti cannons and all this other stuff. But it really isn't. We were sitting there. They told us the, the orphanage director would be there any moment. And we heard the door open. A woman walked in, had cold. I remember he leaned around the corner like, what's up? <clears throat> Sally had a blue dum-dum, gave it to him. And the rest, as you know, is still being written down as history. But in that year, we, we've gotten to watch as, as Cole has learned more English, as he's eaten and eaten, <laughs> and we've watched as he's sort of outgrown his clothes, as he's developed, really as he's developed his own personality. And one of the things that I think is, is, is cute and hilarious now that I know in 10 years I'm going to absolutely hate uh, is when Cole may be playing with blocks or something, and I'll say, hey, Cole, do you want to do this? Huh? That's what he does. He'll just, huh? I'm sure you got that from me. 
That's funny. He doesn't understand what I'm asking him, or he's never heard of it before, or it makes him sort of wonder, what in the world is Dad talking about? Whether he's two, or 12, or 22, I'm sure there will always be things he'll go, huh? Because I'm 32. And there's still things that I go, huh? Been studying as a student of the Bible now for well over a decade, decade and a half. And there are still times, still times when I read something and I go, huh? This is one of them. It may be the biggest time. And, and the thing is, some of you have been in my office, you see all those nice books, they don't know. They don't know. They, they say the same thing. In fact, the, one of the fathers of the church, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, around the, the early 5th century, late 4th century, said, there's no way these words came from the lip of Jesus. That's what he said. A guy I'm reading a lot of lately, mostly because out of interest, I like him, I've heard him, uh, I'm thinking about writing some stuff about him in my doctoral work. David Lose, a Lutheran uh, minister and a, a Lutheran homiletician, said, when you come across this passage in the lectionary, read it and say to your folks, I have no idea what Jesus is saying, and give the benediction and go home. <laughs> You're not getting off that easy because I'm not getting off that easy. We read passages like this. Now, some of, them, some of them I can read and I can say, okay, that was a different time. Those are different people. You know, they still thought their world was flat, that the sun went around the earth, all this kind of stuff. But this is Jesus. And the truth is, if it was so hard and it wasn't, Luke probably would have said, you know what, like Matthew and Mark, I'm going to skip this one. I'm not going to put it down. But it's there. And so, so with this text, sometimes we have, to be, we have to be like Jacob by the river Jabbok. God shows up, tells us something, and we've got to wrestle with him. The problem with that is it often leaves us walking with a limp afterwards. It leaves us changed, leaves us different. And sometimes we like to tap out. Sometimes we like to, when we're wrestling with God and we're trying to figure out what God is trying to say to us, we try to find an easy way. We try to cheat it a little bit. And I've wanted to do that with this text. Let me tell you. It's hard on the surface. I mean, Jesus tells a parable about a dishonest manager. Now, if it were the one before it, I can handle that. The parable of the prodigal son. Heard it a million times, heard it a million different ways. I can handle that one. Or if it's the one we read next week. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus. That's a story I can preach. That's a story I can read and get something out of. But the dishonest manager? Jesus praises a man for not doing his job, and then when he gets caught screwing it all up and doing it the wrong way, Jesus praises this guy? I don't get it. I don't understand it. Some have said what actually happened is, is this. When, when the dishonest manager is caught, you know, the man, there's a rich man, has a lot of property, finds out his steward, his manager, squandered his money, calls him up, says, here's your pink slip, get to walking, but before you clean out your desk, I need an account of everything you've been keeping track of. And he goes, oh boy, <laughs> he's going to find out. I better go make it right. And so he goes, and there's one who owes a hundred, a hundred jugs of oil. A hundred, the word there is baths, baths of oil. It's about nine, 900 gallons of oil. Comes out to about three years' wages worth of oil. This ain't, you know, going over to the store and, and not having the money and just borrowing a jug of Wesson. 900 gallons of olive oil. He says, how much do you owe? Oh, I owe 100. Well, just make it 50. And folks have said, you know what that is, don't you? That's his commission. That's the manager's commission. He's given up his half just to make his master happy. Now, that'll preach. That'll preach. To say, oh, just delay gratification, delay your own things, and wait, and somewhere down the line, God will, God will reward you. Just delay, put off what's yours in, in order to serve other people. That'll preach. I wish it said that, though. I don't think Jesus said that. I don't think that's what the parable is about. The numbers don't make sense when we look at them in the ancient world. It doesn't make sense. But some have said it, and, and, and that's fine, and they can make it work. But I, I just don't, I don't think that's what Jesus says. And then there are some, some who will say, this is actually a parable about getting back to the Bible. Oh, that's good. That's good. When you can preach about getting back to the Bible, folks will perk up. It's about time we got back to the Bible. 
That's, that's, good. that's good. You know why, I say that, why they say that? They say when the dishonest manager is caught and goes and forgives the debts, do you know what he's forgiven? That 50 out of 100, that 20 out of 100? Interest. Did you know? Did you know? At least four or five times. In the books of the law, Leviticus 25, in Exodus, and Deuteronomy, do you know what it says there? Do not charge interest. We forget about that one, don't we? We read the other ones around there and go, we got to li- listen to this. This verse is important. we got to listen to this one. But that interest stuff, that's up for interpretation. So they say he's calling his manager back to the Bible. Don't charge interest. You shouldn't do that. And the manager goes, oh, I'm so glad I have a biblical steward. That's what they say. But that's not what the text says. That's not what Jesus says. This isn't a parable about getting back to the Bible. Now, now when I picture, when I picture this dishonest steward, I don't, I don't see him like the Sunday school pictures we have. You know those pictures? Sometimes they're in our books. Sometimes, maybe when you were a kid, we put them on the wall little like oil painting somebody's done. They all look the same. The, it doesn't matter if it's 3,000 years in the Old Testament or just now with Jesus in the New Testament. They all look the same. They're wearing sort of a wool tunic, cinched at the middle, got on sandals, maybe barefoot, always got a dark beard and dark hair. That's how I, I want it, but that's not how I imagine the dishonest man. As you know how I see him. He's got on a green felt shirt, leather belt, around his waist. Maybe he got a little knife stuck in it. He's wearing tights. Got on leather shoes. A little pointed hat with a great big feather coming out of it. And he doesn't have that, that first century beard. No, no, no. Nice, clean, pointed goatee and a French waxed mustache. A long bow in his hand. That's who I see. It's Robin Hood. It's Robin Hood. I mean, you know Robin Hood, right? He, he's one of those, fig, uh, those figures of English fiction. We don't know where he came from, don't know if he was real. The first time he really makes any sort of significant appearance in literature is in one of my favorite books, Ivanhoe. Sir Walter Scott in the 8th century writes about him. Robert of Loxley. What was he famous for? Robbing from the rich to give it to the poor. That's, that's who I want to see right there. That'll preach. That's a good sermon. That's a good text. After all, like, like Stacy read earlier in the service, you can't go far in the Bible without reading that kind of stuff. Amos, you can't, you can't read Amos and come away from it thinking, oh, Amos really likes rich people. It's not there. Amos says you, he says about the, the wives of the northern kingdom of Israel, he calls them cows of Bashan. They've eaten so much, they're fat. They lounge on ivory couches. The folks are selling uh, a poor, uh, just in human trafficking, for not just silver, but for a pair of sandals. They don't care. That'll preach. Robin Hood, there he is in the text. Robin from the rich to give to the poor. But I don't think that's what it says. I don't think that's what it says. I think it's a parable about a rich man who had a manager, who squandered his property, and when he got caught, decided to save his own skin, and he went to his master's debtor and forgave 150 and forgave 120. Maybe he thought he'd get away with it. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. And then his master commended him for his dishonesty. And then Jesus says, make for yourselves friends by dishonest love. I think that's what it says. And I hate it. Really, I can't stand it. It bothers me. It bothers me that Jesus would say these things. Do you know why? Do you know why it bothers me? Because that's me. That's me. God has given me so much. Do you know what I've done with it? Have I built a great kingdom for God? Have I done wonderful things for God? Have I paved the road for all to come into the kingdom for God? Have I done that? No. Squandered it. It's gone, most of it. Whether it's, whether it's financial things, whether it's relationships, whether it's opportunities in my life, squandered it. It's gone. Oh, yeah, there have been ones I've picked up along the way and made good on, but it's gone. And then in those times when Jesus catches me, I try to make it up. 
Try to make it up to him best I can. Try to make it up. Oh, I'll, I'll forego whatever. I'll, I'll do whatever I need to do to make it up. And it's never right. It's never quite enough. But there in the end, there in the end, there's the rich man telling his steward, good job. Commending him. Because in the end, we're going to squander things. Squander what God has given us. We're going to mess up. We're going to mess up. When God catches us, we're going to come running back, thinking we've got it figured out. And in the end, God is always not going to say, oh, yeah, you don't get in. There's always grace. Always grace to say, well, you try. Always grace to welcome us back in. Even when we screw up, even when we go away. Even, that's why I don't like it, you see. I want the guy to do the right thing. From the beginning, don't squander the master's property. Do what you're supposed to do from the beginning. But how many of us have? How many of us have done the right thing from the beginning? How many of us can look back and say, I've done it all right. There it is. I've got the accounts written down right here. Done it all right from the very beginning. Not a single one of us can say that. And there will be times. Times in our lives, just as they have been in the past, when God catches us with a need in accounting. And we try to set it right, and we know we can't. But there still is God's grace. I don't know if that's right. It's one of those things that makes me go, huh? But I like to think, I like to think if I'm in that manager's shoes, that God like his boss, like the man who owns the land, will be there to commend me, to forgive me, to love me, and to offer me grace far greater than I can ever deserve. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us when we squander the good things that you give us. Lord, when you catch us and we fail even to make up for them, for we know we never can. And yet, Lord, in your grace, you commend us anyway. In your grace, you still welcome us in and love us. And you still call us to be your children and your servants. So give us strength, Lord. Give us strength not to squander the opportunities, the property that you give us. But give us the grace, Lord, to be good stewards. Always, always, Lord, pressing on. Always looking to serve you, our Lord, our God, our Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Hymn 330.
As you go out from this place, may you look all around you, listening for the voice of God and the opportunities he grants you to be good stewards of all the good things that God gives you.